right. Yeah, so I, I want to start by going back more than 80 years because I, I want to look a little bit at Kyle Koenig's childhood because uh, as most of you probably know, this healing impulse was something that uh, expressed itself quite early. It's quite unusual that in this small child, Kyle Koenig, something expressed itself which had to do with his healing impulse later on. And that was the experiences he had in the city of Vienna. This tremendous, um, let's say, cultural city of Vienna, and at the same time, terrible poverty. So he was living in this polarity, richness, richness of culture, but also the rich city of Vienna. And on the other hand, very poor people, very poor people. And he experiences already as a very small child, this imbalance. And of course, as you know, healing has to do with the balance. And so this is something that lived in him already very early. He tried to do his best as a child to balance out the poverty of the people around him. And so in a way, one can see, say that was already the impulse to heal. Now, one can also say it is conscience which moved him, moved him very deeply. And this is a theme, conscience, that he spoke about the whole of his life. From early on in his uh, childhood diaries, his youth diaries, we find he tries to come to terms with this feeling of conscience. And it's something he spoke about right until the end of his life how important it is that we train our conscience today. And I think it, it has become a very important property, the question of conscience today. Do we really feel conscience? Because, of course, without feeling conscience, we do not feel the will to, to act. So right until these very days when the most important countries of the world, this is what I think they are at least, meet to talk about the climate change, then we have to ask, do they really feel their conscience burning to act on what they actually know for a long, long time already? Knowledge does not lead to healing, but conscience can lead to healing. So Karl Koenig experienced this poverty, the needs of his time. And that was why he, as a youngster, he already became a socialist. That uh, wasn't very often spoken about in Campil because uh, uh, socialist wasn't maybe uh, an easy word to use in the early days of Campil. But we do know he became a socialist as a youngster because he felt the needs in social life so deeply many needs he experienced and one of them was of course that during his youth the first world war was playing and he really experienced this in the depths of his soul how the whole world was suffering and right in the middle of this suffering of the world he stood on the side of the street as the last emperor of austria was carried to his grave in 1916 Imagine he was 14 years of age and this youngster experienced something. I'm sure he wasn't really conscious what it was, but he knew he was experiencing something of utmost importance, that this very special country, this country that was put together from so many different folk spirits, so many different languages and cultures, that actually this life of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was already ending. So these are things I think which are very important to realize with Karl Koenig that he had what he later called historic conscience. A conscience not just for the single human beings but for humanity. And realize that Austria had a very important role to play or would have had a very important role to play in world history which it couldn't play any longer. 
So Karl Koenig took all these questions with him right up to university. And when he was studying medicine, he looked for people who could answer these questions, could realize the depth of questions that lived in him. It was not just a matter of learning medicine, gaining knowledge to be able to treat patients, but it went much deeper than this and much wider. And he was extremely disappointed by the fact that he didn't get answers to his questions at the university. Only in very, very few people and very few places did he find any answers. And that is why, of course, he found his way in the end to anthroposophy. But one of the most important encounters of his life was then, of course, with Ita Wegmann. And I particularly want to mention her in this context because, of course, she was the image of healing in his time for Karl Koenig. He experienced her very deeply as something like a mother figure for, not just for him personally, but also for his impulses of healing. <laughs> so for Ita Wegmann, it was quite clear that healing could not be carried out just for the individual human being. But one has to see the human being in his social setting. One has to see the human being in the context of the earth. And this was what uh, Rudolf Steiner expected of Ita Wegmann. She was to be not only the uh, head of the medical section, she was also to be the leader of the agricultural section of the Goethe Anum. I think this is so important to realize that for Rudolf Steiner, it was clear already that these belong together. And so Karl Koenig experienced in Ita Wegmann this wonderful personality, this grand personality, if I may say it like this, uh, who carried this threefold healing impulse, which he himself had experienced as a child already. And now he sees it in her, the will to heal the human being, the will to see this healing or create this healing within the social context and within the context of the earth. So as we know, this came to a certain peak or to a very special experience for Karl Koenig very soon when he went to Allesheim in 1827, in, sorry, in 1927, when he experienced the Advent, the first Advent Sunday and the Advent garden the candles, which I'm sure you all know. But we have to realized that something rose in his soul on that day, which on the one hand made him sure this was the goal of his life. This was the uh, direction his life should take. It touched his will so deeply. And on the other hand, it became an image. And I think this is important to see. It became such a strong image for him. This which he spoke about later quite often, the candle on the hill. This candle in the middle of the moss garden on the first of Advent became an image for what he wanted so dearly as a healing impulse. And of course, he was not sure, he did not know what this impulse would be, what it would entail, but he did know the image. And he knew that these people with handicaps, these people with disabilities, were his friends and allies on this path of healing. It's quite amazing, I think, that in the very first month of his time in Allerzheim and working together with Ita Wegmann, this image becomes so strong and so deeply rooted in his soul already. So, <coughs> see in this connection to Ita Wegmann is 
that the width of his healing will could come to a certain fruition. He could also come to realize that it was also a healing impulse for his times, or I think we can still say for our times, and not just the earth as a, as a physical body, but the earth as a, a transition of development, as a movement of development in history, in world history, in history of the universe. So we see the large context that this little man, Karl Koenig, found himself embedded in. And something he shared with Ita Beckmann was the knowledge that the child, the human child, stands in the center, in the forefront of this healing will. And it was a little bit later, 1933, that Ita Wegmann actually wanted to, very deeply wanted to start evacuation of children from Central Europe because she realized how difficult life was going to become for all human beings. But she wanted to evacuate children, particularly from Germany, but from the rest of Central Europe too. Of course, that couldn't happen in that sense, but we do know that very soon the evacuation of Jewish children could actually take place. And we can assume that this was something that Ita Wigman moved, although it's not, let's say, an, uh, an outer cause of the Kindertransporte, but it was. Uh, um, this deep will to help the children that certainly on a, a deeper level moved the world to save Jewish children that were then evacuated, particularly to Britain, to America, some, and to other countries. And of course, we also know that some of these children who were evacuated actually first children to be in Campil, before it was called Campil even, in Kirkton House, the very first child they received was one of these children from the Kindertransporte. And so over the years, uh, many children and then also youngsters and adults in the end, who were refugees from Central Europe, could join this um, new impulse in the north of Scotland. It was an impulse through refugees and for refugees. And then Kalkuni could also see how children and adults with handicaps, with learning difficulties, were also refugees of their time. Kalkuni himself was a, a refugee on many levels, but that's actually not our theme today, but certainly the child. And it's interesting, and I, I, you've all read our newsletters, I'm sure you all read them frequently. Uh, one of our last newsletters, we uh, brought a, a, a very interesting letter by Karl Koenig, because we hadn't known until that time that actually Karl Koenig also started child evacuation after the war. 1945, directly after the end of the war, he helped that children could be evacuated from Central Europe who were still in very, very difficult circumstances, starving, cold, and also in politically very uncertain situations. Many, many children were actually evacuated out of the situation. And it was Karl Koenig who set this in motion in 1945. So the child plays a very big part in all this question of, of healing for Karl Koenig, for his impulse. And we can say it was Ita Wegmann who led him to meet the child of Europe. Unfortunately, we don't have records of it, but we do know that he had conversations with Ita Wegmann about Kaspar Hauser, about the child of Europe. 
And so this also became part of his image for the future. And of course, we know this image came to a special sort of <clears throat> artistic expression right at the end of the war with the Christmas story. So the being of the child and the child of Europe became something that was common ground for this healing impulse of Karl Koenig and Ita Wegmann. And so when Ita Wegmann died in 1943, Karl Koenig had this very strong feeling, this very strong impulse to write what we know as the Requiem, which is actually written for Ita Wegmann, but it is about Hauser. This is, I think, a very moving thing because it's 1943, it's wartime, Ita Wegmann dies and he feels that the guiding spirit in a way, the, the guiding angel almost of what was to become the Kampel movement had left the earth. Ita Wegmann had died and he had seen her as really the guide of his work from the beginning, from 1927, right the way through until the wartime, when this candle was being lit on the hill of Camp Hill. Of course, one couldn't have lights on in those days, so one had to have a candle and darken the windows because it was wartime. So this image of the candle on the hill became the candle on the Camp Hill Hill. That was very, very striking for Karl Koenig that that could actually come the center of his work in Camp Hill. <coughs> but another element that has to do with the child is, of course, what we know from the Gospels, <coughs> the words of Christ that you cannot reach, you cannot find the kingdom of God you cannot find the spiritual world unless you become like a child. This is something that is very important, I think, in the Gospels. Maybe it hasn't been seen in its true depth yet. But we're coming to a time now in history, I think, when this becomes more and more evident, how important it is this element of the child. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we should become childish. And I do say that not only with tongue in cheek, but I say it because it is definitely a danger. We can be tempted to become a little bit childish. And that's not meant, of course. The, the child, of course, still brings an element of the spiritual world, of heavens with it. We can experience that in the eyes of the child. And our task today is to regain this connection to the spirit, to find this connection consciously, where of course the child has this unconsciously, subconsciously, and loses it, unfortunately, with consciousness. This is, I think, a very important fact to remember, to see that our consciousness is the reason that we lose the contact to the spiritual world. We can maybe even say more exactly, it's intellectual consciousness, which cuts us from the spiritual world. What we need to find is a, an element of birth. So now when we go towards Christmas, we come towards Advent and can remember Karl Koenig's experience. We can realize it is a festival of birth, but also of rebirth, finding the forces of the child in the human soul. Now, I, I would like to say a, a word still about agriculture because I think that's very important in connection to this healing impulse. And as I said, Koenig knew that Ita Wegmann was being asked to lead the agricultural section. That actually never took place for 
many reasons that I won't go into now, but she never had the opportunity to lead the agricultural section of the Gautiana. But Karl Koenig would take this impulse very soon from Ita Wegmann, from Arlesheim to Pilgrimshain. And it's an amazing fact that actually the Pilgrimshain castle was given for the work of curative education and was at the same time an experimental farm for biodynamics. Because the von Jetze family, and maybe there are some of you there that know some of the family still, the von Jetze family who gave the castle were part of this biodynamic impulse, had been at the agricultural conference, which was not far from Pilgrimshain. So Rudolf Stein had been to this part of the world, had set this impulse for healing of the earth into the ground of Silesia, where Karl Koenig began, so to speak, his career or began the work which then became Pill. So we see an impulse set into the earth by Rudolf China. What was this impulse? I would like to remind you that he was asked about the fruitfulness of the earth, the fertility of the earth. Because in the beginning of the 20th century, and right up until the 20s of the 20th century, it was a, a very, very important question. One knew that the earth was no longer fertile enough to nourish humanity. And of course, in the 20s, um, there were people going hungry already in Central Europe because the crops were failing. And so Rudolf Steiner was asked to set a healing impulse for the fertility, for the life forces of the earth in 1924-25 in Silesia. Now, we have to see, of course, that just prior to that, while Karl Koenig was a young person in Vienna, the invention took place during the First World War, which would change agriculture so strongly, what we know as chemical engineering. Because exactly during the First World War, uh, an invention was made, and I remind you of this because this took place in Berlin too, not far from Rudolf Steiner House, just one street away from Rudolf Steiner House, the synthetic construction of um, um, ammoniac was invented. Now, this led, of course, and the reason this invention was to um, find artificial fertilizers for the earth, to bring nitrogen into the earth. So that's why ammoniac was needed. And this, of course, changed agriculture. This was the reason, so to speak, why Rudolf Steiner gave the agricultural course. Exactly the same time that Karl Koenig was experiencing this death of the earth, death of humanity, of course, to death of spiritual impulses in Vienna through the First World War. And this invention of synthetic ammoniac was not only um, an invention which could potentially have changed the fertility of the earth, which was hoped, but at the same time, it was used for wartime. It was the first chemical weapon. That was the poisonous gas that was used in the First World War. So I think this is an incredible picture to imagine just here in Berlin, that this twofold impulse was set synthetically, synthetic chemical to change the fertility of the earth to the positive, one hoped, and at the same time to unleash unknown death forces in the military world in the First World War. And we know also that it was this substance that changed the life of Adolf Hitler. 
that is just to show you how intricately connected these questions are of the historic situation that Karl Koenig lived in and how he felt the need for healing in a very, very wide sense. Now, to remind you, Peter Wegmann's death in 1943, and when Karl Koenig wrote this amazing these amazing words about Kaspar Hauser, this requiem. It was exactly the time that Nuremberg was bombed. The city of Nuremberg was destroyed on the day that Ita Wegmann was created. And this is something that Karl Koenig writes at the end of his requiem, of course. So intricately intricately connected are the world situations that when Ita Wegmann leaves this earth without being able to fulfill these tasks of healing connected with agriculture, connected with the illness of the earth, leaving the earth at a time where the place, the city where Kaspar Hauser had appeared was bombed for no reason particularly, except that we can assume that the British particularly were interested in destroying the spirit of Central Europe, culture, Central Europe. So this impulse that Kai Koenig could experience very strongly also in Silesia, and took with him into the founding of Campil, very strongly so, was of course what you call today a reciprocal healing process because of course the hope is to work on the earth in a healing way but at the same time we also know to have contact to the earth is also a healing impulse and particularly in the question of curative education, in the question of social therapy, working with the earth is the therapy to assist the individual to incarnate into this world. And this is also a very important fact today because more and more people are severed, not just from the spirit world, but from nature and from agriculture from the earth, from the being of the earth. I think this is important to, to realize when we think about this healing impulse. And of course, in the early days of Camp Hill, when Karl Koenig was trying to connect these two impulses of curative education, became then social therapy too, and the farming impulse, the work on the earth. He said in Botten Village, when the farm could start there, that in actual fact, one couldn't carry all this destiny without that Mother Earth could help to carry it. I think these are profound words that in working with the earth, we can, let's say, help the earth to uh, accompany us, we can entice the earth to help us in this healing process, not only healing in the sense of therapy or something like that, but in the sense of incarnation, in the sense of finding oneself. And just in these, these years, of course, this uh, very important book was published I'm sure you all know, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson's book, which was published in 1962, and was really the start of environmental consciousness the world over. This was the start of um, protest against environmental dangers. It was the, the fight against chemical engineering in agriculture. I think that's quite amazing to realize. And what is not so uh, widely known is that Rachel Carson 
uh, took her knowledge from biodynamic farmers. So this book, which changed the way we connect to the earth, the way we connect to our environment, our times, the, so to speak, the seed for the environmental um, movements of today, this seed was sown out of biodynamic agriculture. And Koenig was quite aware of this. As soon as the book was, uh, was available, he, of course, always read the books immediately when they were available and expected everybody else to as well. He asked Al Alexander Mia to write a review about it. And you can find this review in the Crescent in 1963. And in the same Crescent where the review of Silent Spring to be found, Karl Koenig wrote an editorial, which is quite special. It's entitled Man at the Threshold. Now you see these, these two aspects, the earth, so to speak, at the threshold, threshold of fertility, and the human being at the threshold. This, this um, theme, this crescent could all be written today because we have to see how today we still stand at this threshold, but in a very endangering manner. Human, the human race is dangling across the threshold and the earth is no longer able to carry the human being. So what Karl Koenig took from Silesia was this working together with the earth, a threefold healing, the healing of the human being, the healing of social life, and the healing of the earth. And this belongs intricately together. It is not possible to heal a human being without finding his social environment and his world environment. It's not possible to think about healing earth without healing society, without healing social life, and in turn, looking towards health of the human being. And of course, he knew very early, he knew from his experience in 1927 already, that people with handicaps, children with handicaps, with developmental disabilities are, are our teachers in this respect because they help us to understand these connections and they help us to understand the human being in a true way. But not only to understand in the sense of learning, in the sense of intellectual knowledge, but learning in a very deep way, learning in the sense that these people help us to move our will. Our will is aroused by the needs of the other. And I think this is very central to understand Kalkonik's healing impulse, that it cannot be purely intellectual. It cannot be purely soul um, item. Otherwise, you know, we could, uh, we could just become childish. No, it's arousing the will. So the people with severe handicaps, particularly, are leading us towards a new culture of the will. It's the question of conscience and compassion as healing elements in today's world. The healing will, not just the knowledge for healing. And this is, of course, very centrally the task of Kaspar Hauser even today, because Kaspar Hauser is the image in itself of compassion and conscience. If you read Karl Koenig's essay from 1961 about Kaspar Hauser, you will find it leads to this question of compassion. 
And right around his visit in 1961 in Ansbach and in Karlsruhe, he gave this amazing series of lectures about the human conscience. So we see it's always embedded in, or, or let's say it's always in the light of this being of Kaspar Hauser when we look at the healing impulse of Kampil or of Kampil. <laughs> Together with those who are the children of Europe. That is what Karl Koenig called the first children that he was seeing, the children of Europe, so to speak, Kaspar Hausers, those with handicaps, with disabilities, he called the children of Europe. Not because they're childish, but because they are have they carry something new to lead us forwards like Carlo Pizza said in his play it's a, a crusade of children they are leading the way for the battle of our time the battle for the spirit in our time and of course this task of finding the child in us finding our new connection to the spirit world this is not something which is fulfilled by what one calls inclusion today. Including people with handicaps in society is not helping them to heal our world, unfortunately. We have to find new paths of inclusion. I think this is very important for the future of Camp Hill to see this healing impulse, which is carried commonly carried together with the children, with the villagers, with those we look after. We carry this impulse together, this healing impulse for the world, for our times. That has certainly not ended with the United Nations Charter. Our handicap, on the other hand, is very often our intellect, of course because it leads us to false decisions, false judgment. It leads us to think out of the past and not out of the future. The child in us, which is to think out of the future, but the intellect forces us to think out of the past. And this is cold intellect, it is without warmth. I think the child in us is this element which wants to be born out of the realm of warmth, out of the realm of interest and passion. That is the realm of Kaspar Hauser. So in a way, one can say, one of Karl Koenig's most foremost tasks in healing was showing ways of healing the intellect, that we see our intellectual powers actually as a very strong handicap. We are linked to many, many people who do not have these intellectual powers and therefore can help us out of this situation of today's intellect. Through them, we do not just understand, but we experience what the task is. Security of education is experiencing where the will needs to be applied. And of course, social therapy, I always say social therapy is not um, a therapy for those living in social therapeutic centers or in village communities. Social therapy is a therapy for social life, full stop, or one can say for society. Karl Koenig said it's a seed to be planted into today's society. And I think we can really say today, because the world he saw was definitely the world of today. He was very future oriented. So what did Karl Koenig experience in the Advent Garden in 1927? I think now it's, it's uh, coming up to Advent time, it's November, and we, transition now from this 
uh, from the darkness of November to the inner light of Advent, an incredibly important time in the year where we are asked to look for this light and warmth in our own depths, not in the outer world. But what did Karl Koenig experience? Surely he experienced that through the light of the Advent garden, the individual child was able to find its own path of incarnation into this world. It was a, a therapy, so to speak, if one likes to call it that, for the spirit to find its path into the darkness of our world. That was the candle on the hill. And I do believe that today we are still very much in need of this candle on the hill in the darkness of our times even if the darkness of our times seems very, very light because of the artificial light we live in. We live in very light times. Even physically, we know that the sun is lighter today than it was 80 years ago. We're living outwardly in light and inwardly so much in darkness. And up to the very modest fashion, important in a very modest fashion, ask, how we can create this candle on the hill to invite the spirit to descend. Now that is, uh, I showed you the uh, letter paper of the Calcutta Institute just a few minutes ago. That was for a specific reason also, because I, I wanted to remind you that this uh, logo of Campbell I, I like to remind people of this, the Loco of Campbell is actually this event of the Advent Garden. It is the dove descending into the earthly world. That is what biodynamic agriculture is about. That is what curative education is about. And that is what Koenig's impulse for healing was about. The question of the descent of the spirit into the darkness of our world into the darkness of the earth, but also the darknesses of our time. We can also say the darknesses of the human soul, of course. But we also know that we do not wish to um, just create light on this world, but to create balance. Health is a question of balance between the light of the spirit and the darkness or the weight of the physical, the earth. It's a question of balancing the two. So I think the logo of the, the Campbell movement is actually quite a, a wonderful sign because this wonderful artistic balance we found there. And of course, it was the architectural element of the stairs where one needs the sense of balance. If you look in the, in the hall in Camp Hill, and you will see how the wonderful sign of Camp Hill, this logo, sits in the <laughs> above the space of the chapel and balances the spirit with the physical world. So we see healing actually very much as a threefold impulse, and I, I'd just like to remind you of this, that it is an impulse where we need to turn with our will to the spirit, to the spirit as the true home, the true place, the true creative space of the human being, and at the same time, the, the source of fertility, the source of, let's say, life forces, without wanting to call it etheric forces, but that is, of course, what we mean. The source of etheric life, the force which actually creates nature around us, is the same source out of which we are born. Now, this is something that Karl spoke about, wrote in his diary, before he met 
Goethe before he met anthroposophy. As a young man, he was already convinced that this is an important fact. We are created out of the spirit world, out of the same space nature around us is created. And of course, we know that later on, he talked very much about the animal kingdom and our brotherhood with the animal kingdom, not our descent from the animal kingdom, but brotherhood with the animal kingdom because we originate from the same source. Our source, not the animal kingdom, but we have a common source in the spirit world. So that's the first level of healing, is turning to the spirit to find this source, this, these wellsprings of life forces. And the second level of healing is actually the question of social life. How do we as human beings enable each other to develop? Because that is, of course, we know the necessity for every child. A child cannot learn to walk and to speak and to think without other human beings. And Karl Koenig makes quite clear that nothing in society can be created without its connection from one human being to the other. We enable each other to develop. So yes, we need to turn, of course, to the spirit. We need to create spiritual life. But at the same time, we need to create social life because that is where these forces of the ether, the living forces, actually permeate the individual and allow the individual to develop. And the third level of healing is, of course, to turn to the earth itself. And the earth, of course, and uh, I know this is today quite clear, the earth is not just this physical thing we stand on, the soil, the plants, the animals, but the earth includes very strongly the atmosphere around us, the spheres around the physical earth, which become less and less physical as we go outwards. We know this today, even in outer science. And we know it is of greatest importance for the question of the health of the earth and the human race today. These sheaths around the earth. And there we can particularly experience this very central element of healing that has to do with rhythm. Rhythm is the central element of healing in all levels. It's the central part of social life. The rhythm of moving towards, in a soul way, moving towards the other person. Rudolf Steiner says to sleep into the other person and to wake up in oneself. It is a rhythm, a social rhythm. The rhythm between antipathy and sympathy, the rhythm between all the polarities we live with, this is the healing element in social life. But it is also, of course, the healing element in human health altogether. That is why education as a healing education was created by Rudolf Steiner completely out of the being of rhythm. All of education is rhythm. It has very little to do with the intellect, but has to do with the rhythm of waking and sleeping and so on and so forth. So I would like to just go into a, a last phase of my talk so we can get into conversation and remind you that if we look back 80 years to this impulse that Karl Koenig took to Scotland, then we have to see how, and I like to remind people of this, that actually the women started the work. They started the work in Kirkton 
and particularly they started the work in Camp Hill. The women were the founders of Camp Hill. The men were in the prison of war camp. They were interned, as one says, alien enemies. Very strange. But there we see something very particular because while the women were creating the outer life, they created the, one can say, the, um, the sheaths around the outer life, creating the rhythms too. At that time, the men were creating the inner impulse at the Isle of Man. Strangely, it's also called the Isle of Man. Why wasn't the, the Isle of Woman, you know, but there we are. And on this Isle of Man, we find again um, in three levels, Karl Koenig creating something which could be the life, the life flow of Campil, the rhythms of Campil. And one thing was, of course, the, the Bible, the realization that religious life needs to be founded very deeply um, and created out of our connection to the Gospels, created in a rhythmical way every Saturday. It's, it's the rhythm which is so important, how the being of Christ is connected to our earthly world through the rhythms. We know this, of course, from the foundation stone. Christ being lives in the rhythms around the world these spheres around the world that have, of course, very centrally to do with our question of climate today. That is where the Christ being is. So this area of religious life in rhythms, that means, quite obviously, the festivals. I believe me is the central piece of festivals. It's where one can prepare the festivals, one can um, find new impulses for the festival, for this rhythm in our spiritual life. And then the second uh, thing is that Kai Koenig there realized on the Isle of Man that this image of the dove descending has very centrally to do with social life how it should evolve in Hill. And he asked the, um, the people, the, the women particularly, who were um, doing the work at that time, he encouraged them to uh, occupy themselves with St. John. Because this element of baptism, the dove descending into the earthly world, was going to be so central for what was to become the healing of social life. And we know, of course, how important the Whitson Festival was for Karl Koenig. It was Whitson when Kirtson House was opened. And it was Whitson again when the men were taken to the internment camp. Again and again, the Whitson Festival becomes great, of great importance for Karl Koenig and Campbell. I won't go into that too deeply, but of course, it is the festival of the arrival of Hauser. It is one likes the birth of Kaspar Hauser into outer society. Of course, he was born at Michaelmas. He was born into society, into social life. Whitson. That's an amazing picture. Now, if you look at one of Kai Koenig's pictures that he drew on the Isle of Man, you will find a very a uh, very special secret. And I, I wonder how many people have actually al already recognized that. In Karl Koenig's picture for Michaelmas, for the Michaelmas festival, which is very, um, how shall one say, very mysterious in a way, this being of the mother nature, there he draws, very small, he draws already what became the logo of Camp Hill. But very small, very modest, almost not, um, not to be noticed. But it's right in the center of this being of nature, the cosmic 
being of nature in the picture for Michaelis. And with that, we come to this third level of preparation for the healing impulse of Campil, and that was Karl Koenig's work with the calendar of the soul. And I, I would like to remind you of this very particularly because I think um, this will have to play an even bigger role in our work for the future. Because Karl Koenig realized how with the calendar of the soul, we can practice something which has to do with the cosmic rhythms. He knew, I know this from conversations I've had with people, Koenig knew that the seasons would not for long be the same as we'd known them in Central Europe. Anyway, they're not the same for the whole world. But even in, the, in Central Europe, seasons are now ceasing to have this rhythm. And what we call climate change is in fact very much a question of rhythm. Climate is the rhythm of our world. And this rhythm has been destroyed. So I would just like to remind you that Karl Koenig put this work of the soul calendar very much into the foreground in the creation of this healing impulse of Campil. And from that day, from 1940, there was hardly anything Karl Koenig turned to, whether it was agriculture or medicine or education or embryology or whatever, without turning to the calendar of the soul. So I, I would like to actually finish with something which is much older than 80 years. It goes back to Kalkonik's time in Tunisia. And it's, a, it's an essay he wrote um, in English. He actually gave a talk. It was Whitson in 1932. It was a very special festival, Whitson 1932, where Kalkonik founded the Free School for Social Life with the Christian community priests. And in Pilgrimshain, he gave a talk. And this talk is, I think, very, very pertinent for the questions of our time today. So I'll just read you a bit out of this. Um, it's an essay in English, but it was a, a talk he gave in. If we now realize that we have practically lost sight of the way in which our life is bound up with the seasons, we shall see why it is that we can no longer recognize the power and necessity of the great festivals of the year. Those, however, who live with children soon become aware that these seasonal festivals are necessities of life to the child, without which it can hardly exist. We live in different times now, of course. It is really an offense against the being of the child. One could almost say with Feuerbach, a crime against the soul of man. It is an offense against the being of the child to deprive it of any real experience of the festivals and thus to let him grow up as foolish as we are ourselves in this respect. If we no longer believe that these festivals are necessities of our own being, we shall naturally find it impossible to accept the idea that the festivals are not only really necessary to our own being, but to the life of the earth itself, and to the great breathing process of the earth. Uh, this is, I think, that Karl Koenig said this, Whitson, 1932. And it could be so exactly said for the situation of our time today, because that is the great healing question of our time. How can we heal the human being? How can we become human beings? How can we heal society in order to 
<coughs> process of a and a bit later on this sentence comes, I, I would like to read you this one sentence still. If these festivals were abolished, as many in this age seem to desire, then not only the human being, but the earth too, would be shaken out of the true rhythm of being and lose the forces implicit in the process of breathing. I just remember this word we <clears throat> saw in the newspapers or heard in the news, I can't breathe. That seems to be like a motto of our time. It's uh, the central um, difficulty with the coronavirus. It's the central difficulty in climate change. It's the destruction of the breathing process, of the breathing rhythm of our world. So that's the way I would like to link these early experiences of Kalkonik 1932 with today's healing task. And because it's actually now November and we are in this transitionary period, and obviously for you very particularly, this transitionary period from the question of the portal of death to the portal of rebirth. That is the, the transition we go through in November. We all follow this path of outer death and inner rebirth within the month of November, leading into this first advent light at the end of November. And we can know that it is the task, the, the healing task of the human being in November to carry the light and the warmth we have gained during the year into the winter. We are, so to speak, the candle on the hill. And so we see that the, the will to heal is much more than an idea or a theory or knowledge or even much more than just a social institution, which of course Campbell has become. It's become a historical social institution. But more than this, the will to heal, which Karl Koenig wanted to plant into the world, we know because will forces are of the future, lives on. This healing impulse, the healing will does not I without a nature. It lives on. And in the same way, I believe, we can see how these etheric forces of the healing impulse of Campil still live and still ask us to unite ourselves, unite our own will with this spirit will. So that is to say this evening and I hope you could hear okay. Everything all right? We are contemplating. <laughs> I, I know it's not, not easy to get into conversation after a talk, and that's, uh, that's also fine. I, I, don't, I don't worry about it. Um, I, I hope I haven't sent you all to sleep, and I hope I haven't annoyed everybody, but uh, if you're all feeling fine, then that's okay. <laughs> And I, then I, I, I remember you were last in our representative, representative meeting in Yososen some years ago. Wasn't it so? Yes. Yes. And I hope that it will be not too far future that you can visit our meeting again in a different way, not on the, just on the screen. Yeah. You know, th there are two other things that will uh, certainly bring me to... Norway, or at least to Scandinavia in the near future. One thing is this question of Kaspar Hauser, 
where I, I very much hope that we can um, bring the Kaspar Hauser imports to Oslo in the next year. And um, I, I'm very keen that this um, doesn't take place in Kampil, but out of Kampil. And therefore, we're looking to Oslo as the venue. But I, I really very much hope we can use this as part of this healing impulse of Kampil for the world, because of course we don't just want to heal the Kampil communities that need healing as well, but <laughs> it's an impulse for the world. That's the one thing. And the other thing we've just uh, started very strongly here in Berlin is the question of climate change. We just had this international climate conference in Berlin and that was also quite consciously in Rudolfsteiner House in Berlin and not in Kampil to include also other people. And we saw, I think, also very strongly that the Kampil impulse, if we understand Kalkuni uh, correctly, is also an impulse for the climate. So I do hope that this will also um, come as a, a theme in Scandinavia. At the moment, we're actually looking to uh, using the conference center in Jena for a big climate conference out of the Campbell impulse in the near future. So uh, yes, I would very much like to be with you all wherever. I, I'd like to be in Norway, no question. But I would also like to invite you to, to support these initiatives which will not take place in Campbell, out of Campbell. Thank you so much. <laughs> if there is no questions, then this is this very strange thing of Zoom meeting that you are together and then you put the button on <laughs> Mary Bond. <laughs> I would just say good night to you all. And have, a, have good meetings together still. Thank you, Thank you very much. much.